for the time. Welcome to the Society of Simulation Healthcare, uh, Healthcare System Modeling Simulation Affinity Group webinar. I'm Yue Dong from Mayo Clinic, Rochester. Also, we have another. I have another two, uh, two, 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 sorry. Also, we have two, 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 two members from the our um, uh, our uh, group, you know, presenting. Here is John Rice and also Ola. Uh, our presenter today, uh, our presenter today is uh, is uh, Dr. Louis Hollemack uh, from uh, Stanford and uh, with his colleague, uh, Dr. G uh, Dr. Nicole Yamada. So their title for the presentation today is A Clinician's Approach to Human Factors Issues in Healthcare at the Center for Advanced Pediatric uh, Prenatal Education at Stanford. Uh, do uh, please go ahead. Well, thanks, you. It's a pleasure for us to be here and speak with everybody today. Uh, I call this a clinician's approach to human factors issues in healthcare. Uh, neither Dr. Yamada nor I are experts in human factors by any means. What we hope to do in the course of the next 30 or 40 minutes or so is to just you know, show you the kinds of issues that we come up against time and time again in healthcare. How really we are just beginning to uh, comprehend the need to look at human factors, uh, human factors type approach to our daily work. Um, you know, our goal in healthcare really is to deliver safe, effective, and efficient care to our patients. And in order to achieve our goal, we need to optimize our intrinsic human capacities and our human human and human system interactions. And therefore, we have to become proficient in these areas. When we think about our intrinsic human capacities, we, we think of really about three major areas. The cognitive area involves content knowledge, decision making, critical thinking. Our physical attributes, vision, hearing, strength, coordination, dexterity, and a behavioral component. Uh, our ability to lead, our ability to work as a team, and actually manage ongoing stress, uh, not just uh, chronic stress that we all experience over time, but actually ac acute stress during a difficult moments, say like resuscitation. Um, and thinking about the human-human and human system interactions, um, that's where really we, we are uh, very much the novice. We are just beginning to think about the whole area of human factors and ergonomics. Uh, and at least as I've read about this, it seems that uh, a fair number of people agree there are three major branches to uh, that field, the cognitive, physical, and organizational aspects of, of human factors. So when I mentioned proficiency early on, you know, defining proficiency in healthcare, how hard can this really be? Uh, and let's take something very, very simple, moving a patient from one room to another. Now, what I'm going to show you is a, is a video, it's one minute long, where one of uh, our members of our obstetrics team are going to move a maternal patient simulator that's in a bed in a labor in one of our actual labor and delivery rooms. They're going to move that, sim that patient simulator from a bed that's stationed in the room to a gurney that then they will wheel into the uh, cesarean section room. So it sounds like it should be a fairly straightforward thing. Move the patient from one bed to another and then wheel that patient out the door. But what I want to show you is some of our early efforts to, to simulate this and to begin to look at the issues that we face. So excuse the appearance of the female mannequins, not terribly realistic, but it, uh, uh, it fulfills the uh, requirements that we need for this particular uh, simulation. Take this off. Yeah. Oh, it's off or just going to do it? Just keep it on the other side. Okay, just the ID. We don't want to press the other side. Okay, Sally, after the weather, there on the curtain. Okay, come right down there. Okay. All right, let's move her over. Let's go on the ID. Let's pull it over. Pull it over. We can reach it. We can reach it. We can reach it. Okay, we can reach it. So in, in thinking about that, and hopefully the audience isn't laughing too hard, 
Um, when I think about the intrinsic human factor performance, I think about just this team knowing what to do and what sequence. Uh, you saw there was a lot of disconnecting and connecting. Didn't appear to be any real rhyme or reason to it. In fact, at the very end, you saw the ox patient's oxygen source being uh, oxygen tubing being disconnected from the source of oxygen. So at this point, even though she needs oxygen, she's not on it as she's rolling out the door. Uh, a lot of physical um, attributes come into play here in terms of uh, are these the nurses strong enough to actually lift this patient out of one bed into another? Uh, and then finally, some of the intrinsic behavioral uh, uh, characteristics such as uh, uh, the ability to communicate effectively. You heard lots of voices talking simultaneously. I'm not sure anyone actually took a clear leadership role. And the degree of teamwork was a bit variable also. And that's just looking at the human side of things. That's not looking at all the environmental factors that played a role in this team, actually not being able to get this patient moving very quickly. So uh, when we think about proficiency, at least when we think about it in terms of our group here at the Center for Advanced Pediatric and Perinatal Education, we're beginning to define it differently than what has been than how it's been defined in healthcare historically. We look at trying to look at both intrinsic human capacity as well as these human 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 system interactions. And so when we think about that's how we define efficiency, but proficiency, but how do we achieve proficiency? And so if we, again I'm going to show you a, a short video, about a minute long. And what I want you to pay attention to is not necessarily the, the details of what's happening. This is a patient who's actually on heart-lung bypass, and there's an emergency that involves the heart-lung bypass machine. And what ends up happening here is that the, the team that's present in this room, you're going to see probably five or six individuals on camera that are charged with taking care of this simulated emergency. Uh, there is a problem with the, the circuit itself, the technology piece, and there's also a problem with the patient in that as the patient is is disconnected from a functioning circuit, the patient begins to decompensate. So again, it, just watch the overall pattern of activity here. Listen to the voices of the people in the room. This will give you an idea for uh, the way many emergencies in healthcare actually uh, unfold. So as you watch this uh, scenario unfold, um, what you can see, I think, here quite clearly are a number of the environmental type issues uh, uh, that we face on a daily basis. Um, we do not uh, have environments that are oftentimes de uh, designed to help us achieve success. You may be asking yourself, why in a situation where a patient is uh, dependent on a heart-lung machine, you have people who have to kneel on the floor to perform a critical maneuver? in a desperate situation like this. And you saw at least one nurse who was literally surrounded in this, this particular still, surrounded by five other people, and she's down on the floor trying to deal with a critical piece of equipment. And this is not unusual in healthcare. So what we try to do in order to achieve proficiency is practice doing the right thing under as realistic conditions as possible. And I think that you can see in that particular simulation of a, of a heart-lung bypass emergency that that team was doing their very best uh, to respond as they would in real life. You could hear the tension in their voices, you could hear the, the compression of the words, you could hear the tone of their voices going up, and the way they were responding, they were taking it very seriously, and uh, uh, that's what we try to do with the way we use simulation for training and assessment. So I would call that a, a very good example of realistic healthcare simulation. What we really want to spend the rest of the time talking about, though, is simulation as a research tool and how we use it at the Center for Advanced Pediatric and Perinatal Education. Um, 
it's very valuable to us in that we don't need to seek patient family consent uh, because uh, there are no real patients and no, family, no real families that are involved. Uh, this can be a very difficult thing to do when you work in intensive care units like uh, Dr. Yamada and I do uh, to approach a family who is already under duress because uh, their child is actually critically ill and to talk to them about a research study. Uh, it's much easier to do that in a simulated environment. One of the huge benefits of using simulations is that we can control many, if not most, of the variables. So our simulation center uh, can be essentially a laboratory where we conduct experiments. And because our center is, is uh, rigged with a number of high-def remote control pan, uh, uh, pan tilt cameras, uh, we can record everything that happens on video from multiple angles, and that really helps with our ability to analyze those things in detail later. So. We use simulation to study these issues that are very, very difficult to study in the real environment with real patients. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Nicole Yamada, our senior fellow at CAPE. And she's going to during her uh, fellowship here. And then we'll uh, wrap up with a summary. Okay, thank you, Lou. Um, so this is just going to be a, a, a bit about my research project that I've conducted during fellowship. Um, this is a question and a project that I came up with my, on my own and, and with Lou's help developed a study that we ran at CAPE and it was looking at the impact of standardized communication techniques on errors that the team would commit during a simulated neonatal resuscitation. So just to orient you first, this algorithm is the Neonatal Resuscitation Program algorithm, which is the national standard for the care that we provide to newborn infants who may need some um, assistance at birth um, with breathing or maintaining a good heart rate um, or even further resuscitation such as CPR. And I don't need you to memorize or even really fully understand everything that you can see here, but just some things I want to point out is even from a learning standpoint, if you look at that, this algorithm, there's um, some pink bubbles and then there's uh, three other different colored boxes. So the pink bubbles are points at which the healthcare team would assess the infant and determine what the next step of intervention would be. And those uh, interventions are indicated in both green boxes and blue boxes. And if an infant is more stable, the gray boxes. So even from a um, human factors perspective, I'm not quite sure, honestly, why there are so many different colors or potentially there should be different shapes in this algorithm to help people better compartmentalize in their mind their next actions. Um, the other important piece to understanding how this algorithm works is that it works on a 30 second time point. So the infant needs to be reassessed at least every 30 seconds with a change in um, decision making for the clinical care of the infant every 30 seconds. Um, and in this environment, you have a lot of different people and different minds coming together to make those types of assessments and decisions. So here's a, um, a still shot of a simulated neonatal resuscitation that we performed at our simulation center at, at Cape. And at the head of the bed, you can see um, one person uh, breathing for the baby. Um, so she has a mask over, or excuse me, she has a, a breathing tube in the baby's mouth, and she's giving breaths. She's the one that has her thumb out, her right thumb out. Um, and that's the device that we can use to give breaths to a baby who's not breathing on his or her own. The person to her left in the blue vest is doing chest compressions for CPR. Um, the light-haired person standing at the head of the bed is the team leader, so she's in charge of um, keeping situational awareness as far as the infant's uh, current vitals, their previous vitals, whether or not the interventions that we're doing are working, whether or not the people that she's supervising are doing those interventions correctly. And then the person in the dark hair, uh, closer down towards the foot of the bed, is um, putting in a central uh, catheter into the baby's umbilical vein to provide a source um, through which to give medications and fluids to help resuscitate the baby as well. Um, in, to the right of the, the picture, you can see a lot of different dials and screens, um, both right at, directly at the foot of the bed, as well as to the right of the bed next to the stethoscope. That monitor over there um, shows the baby's heart rate and oxygen saturation. Um, the dials and things that you see at the foot of the bed are uh, different measures for the amount of pressure and oxygen that we're giving to the baby when we're breathing for, for it. Um, so obviously there's a lot of data that a team such as this would have to incorporate both on the individual level but then also making sure to share that information and get on the same uh, mental model or same page 
as one another during the resuscitation like this. Um, and we have looked back retrospectively in our field, and we do know that um, there are studies that show that we don't adhere to that algorithm very well. Um, and by medical standards, um, even if you don't have the context of working in neonatology, I can tell you that that algorithm is one of the more simple resuscitation algorithms that we have in healthcare compared to what we need to do for uh, pediatric patients or adult patients. And even so, in our field, we found that people have, um, in one study, a 28% error rate. In another study, a 16 to 55% error rate, um, with the 16% being for studies, or excuse me, resuscitations in which um, teams just needed to prepare the bed for the baby um, in anticipation of receiving a baby from the OB team, whereas the 55% error rate was seen in resuscitations in which the team had to breathe for the baby and do chest compressions, as you saw in that previous picture. Um, and we do know from this research that poor communication has been highly correlated with noncompliance or errors in completing the NRP algorithm. So in my work, I've actually turned towards other fields that have much more experience in how to improve human performance um, and communication. And one of those is aviation. Um, as you may or may not know, when we first started flying commercial airliners much more frequently in the U.S. around the 1960s and 1970s, there was a lot of data that showed that up to 70% of the airline accidents that occurred during that time were due to human error. And of those errors, up to 80% were related to communication. And in response to that, the aviation industry has implemented very rigorous training and a standardized lexicon so that their pilots and air traffic controllers um, can reduce their communication errors. So I was hoping to bring some of that to um, what we do in healthcare and in newborn resuscitation. So my hypothesis for this study was that during complex neonatal resuscitations, healthcare providers would commit reproducible patterns of errors of omission and commission when implementing the NRP algorithm. And that if we expose them to standardized communication techniques, that they would uh, decrease their error rate. Errors relative to adherence to the NRP algorithm. And I made a distinction between errors of omission and commission um, because that has implications for how those errors could be mediated. So errors of omission are failure to perform an intervention that's uh, when it's indicated. So for example, not even doing chest compressions when a baby needs chest compressions to be done. Um, in contrast, errors of commission are um, performing an uh, intervention that's not clinically indicated at all. So for example, doing chest compressions when the baby doesn't need chest compressions. Um, performing an intervention too early or too late. So again, using the chest compression example, starting them too early or starting them too late or performing interventions with an improper technique. So for example, doing chest compressions but um, with the wrong technique, so not uh, doing the right ratio of chest compressions or not pressing deep enough on the chest. Um, again, this is another shot just to orient you to how we use CAPE as our laboratory. So this was um, a pretty typical setup for the scenarios that I used to do neonatal resuscitations in my study. Over on the far left, you can see the mother, um, the mannequin, who has just delivered an infant, and she's lying in her hospital bed. And as in the real clinical environment, if a mother delivered a sick baby vaginally, we would have a bed set up in the room to resuscitate that baby. So that's where you see this team. They're centered around an infant warmer. And they're um, also doing uh, a number of different clinical interventions, including breathing for the baby, chest compressions, um, and preparing other equipment. Uh, looks like the person in red is probably preparing for um, an intubation to breathe for the baby. And in the far right corner at the neonatal resuscitation cart, which has all the supplies that we need to provide a full resuscitation to an infant, you see a nurse preparing um, an IV uh, fluid bolus. And so in this environment, as Lou mentioned, we can standardize pretty much everything. We can standardize physically where the mother is located, where the infant warmer is located, where the um, neonatal resuscitation cart is located. We can standardize all of the equipment that is available to the team, which we use um, the same equipment that we would use in the hospital so that the people, when they come over to our center, are using the same equipment that they're used to seeing in a real clinical environment. Um, we can standardize how data is presented to the, um, the teams that are there. So above the, um, the bed, which is just off the screen, is a patient monitor that looks just like the monitor that we have at the bedside in the neonatal intensive care unit and in our delivery rooms. And that would display data just as it would in the real clinical environment. So we can make things both realistic and standardized. 
The mannequin that we use is made by a company called Laredal, and it's the Sim Newbie mannequin. Um, and again, going back to how we can standardize things, the vital signs that a team could assess for the infant are all um, uh, kept the same. So the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and the breath sounds are all able to be controlled remotely. The team can always auscultate um, and observe the chest um, in the same manner for every scenario to look for um, breath sounds and chest rise and to listen for a heart rate. And you can also palpate the stump of the umbilical cord to feel for a heart rate. And again, as I mentioned, we can display the same vital signs in the delivery room um, as we would in the real clinical environment. So in this study, um, it was a prospective randomized crossover study, and I Im included all healthcare professionals who are responsible for leading a neonatal resuscitation at our hospital. And only those who weren't current in their training um, in the NRP algorithm were excluded. I asked the subjects to perform as the lead resuscitator in two separate simulated uh, newborn resuscitations. And I had two staff from our simulation center act as confederate nurses who could um, uh, keep their behavior the same in every scenario, but also were very standardized in what their skill sets were. They presented as a NICU nurse who had the full skill set of a NICU nurse. And they were also trained to either use or not use a resuscitation lexicon based on randomization. And in addition, the order in which the scenarios was presented to each of the subjects was randomized as well. The two scenarios are um, noted here. Really, um, I don't expect you to have full understanding of it, but what I want you to note is that, for example, the um, vital signs that the infant presented with were exactly the same in each scenario. Um, the heart rate was 50 beats per minute. The baby was not breathing at all, so respiratory rate of zero and their oxygen saturation was undetectable on the monitor because they, um, their heart rate was so depressed. And this, these vitals and these stories that you see here, these one-line clinical summaries, represent infants that are in extreme distress and need full resuscitation. So with the resuscitation lexicon that I had the nurses in this study use, I wanted to uh, develop something that involved standard phraseology and identifying critical pieces of data that would affect how decisions were made in the NRP algorithm. So again, using techniques that I had drawn from the aviation industry. The first was um, in standardizing how people reported heart rate to one another. So in the real clinical environment currently, um, people often try to count the heart rate um, as exactly as possible. And this actually wastes a lot of time. Um, people will try to be quite exact as far as is the heart rate 70 beats per minute or 80 beats per minute, is it 100 beats per minute? And Going back to the algorithm, the two decision points on that algorithm, whether or not we do interventions, are related to if the heart rate's greater than 100 beats per minute or greater than 60 beats per minute. And so really, the only four uh, commands that a person would need to hear in leading a resuscitation in order to make a decision is, is the heart rate greater than 100? Is the heart rate less than 100, which would imply that it's greater than 60 beats per minute? And is it less than 60 beats per minute? Or can nobody just detect or hear the heart rate at all, which would indicate that the infant is not even responding to any of our clinical interventions. And based on those decision points, it helps us decide whether or not we're going to um, give PPV or positive pressure ventilation, which is the medical term for breathing for the baby, or even start chest compression. Or do we have to say, this is not working, and potentially we need to stop our resuscitation? Similarly, with breath sounds, there's a lot of variability in how people describe what they hear when they put a stethoscope on a baby's chest and listen to the sounds that they hear when the baby is breathing or, giving, or being given breaths. And people will say things like the baby is juicy or wet or crackly or diminished. And it's difficult for someone who is always hearing information presented in a different way to make the same clinical decisions or to even plan for what clinical decisions one might make. Um, if they're not sure what they would hear. So I again tried to standardize how breast sounds are reported. And the, um, the main thing I wanted to focus on is, are they present, decreased, or absent? And if any of those things, is it left, right, or bilaterally? Because we have two lung fields um, on the left side of our chest and the right side of our chest, and that's where people would always listen. And so really I tried to standardize again Either breath sounds are present, decreased, or absent, and left, right, or bilaterally. And, the, and those nine commands are the only thing that someone should say and that someone should expect to hear. 
So with data presented in a more standardized fashion, my primary outcome was looking at the error rate in the scenario in which that resuscitation lexicon was used. Would that error rate be lower than when the lexicon was not used? And in addition, I know from looking back at retrospective data that people were always very slow or late, according to the algorithm, in starting breathing for the baby, so positive pressure ventilation, and also late in starting their chest compressions. So I wanted to look secondarily at the time to starting PVV and the time to starting chest compressions. Could we improve that time? And also, what was the number of standardized communication techniques used by the nurses? Could I say that that was a good check for whether or not they behaved as I asked them to? So I was able to recruit 13 subjects for this study. This involved asking people to come in on their day off and spend at least two or three hours at our simulation center. So recruitment was definitely a challenge, but I had a good mix of different clinical experience. And my results showed that um, while I didn't have enough uh, study subjects to make this statistically significant, I was able to show a, tr a trend in improvement in the average error rate as well as the errors of omission in approximately the same um, number of errors of commission. And that when I looked at the average number of communication techniques used, there was almost um, double the number of techniques used in the resuscitation lexicon scenario. So my nurse confederates did perform as I had asked them to. And that there also was a trend in decreased time to starting um, positive pressure ventilation, as well as the time to starting chest compressions. And while those uh, p-values aren't statistically significant, I would argue that, especially in the chest compression category, an improvement in eight, up to eight seconds of starting chest compression sooner um, would be clinically significant. So with this work, I was able to, one, show that during complex simulated neonatal resuscitations that healthcare professionals do commit reproducible patterns of errors when implementing the NRP algorithm. That exposing them to standardized communication techniques led to a trend towards decreased overall error rate, as well as timed initiation of um, positive pressure ventilation and chest compressions. And something that I learned in doing this study was that the standardized communication techniques that I showed you were actually quite easy for my confederates to both learn and implement. Um, I was able to teach them both what the terminology was and why it was important within about five to ten minutes. And then, as you saw from my analysis, they were able to implement those techniques quite readily. And so this study has served as pilot data for the next step in my research career. I hope to um, conduct a larger study where I actually train teams to use or not use the communication techniques and to um, have a bigger sample size so that I can definitively um, answer the question of whether or not um, these types of communication techniques would decrease errors during neonatal resuscitations. Yeah. So I just wanted to briefly mention a few other studies. Uh, I won't go into any detail on these, uh, but just show you the titles of the studies, titles of the manuscripts that have resulted from some of the work that we've done at CAPE as we try to begin exploring uh, some of these very interesting issues. Anand Rajani, who was a fellow with us several years ago, uh, looked at human performance in achieving intravenous access or deep central venous access in uh, newborns during resuscitation, which is actually a very difficult task. And he, what he did is he looked at um, a, 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 pr a procedure that is more commonly done in the emergency room, that's intraosseous access, putting a needle in a bone and comparing that with what we typically do in the delivery room, what we historically have done in the delivery room, which is putting a catheter into the umbilical vein and the umbilical cord. What he found actually, and this was published in Pediatrics in 2011, he found that uh, intraosseous access was uh, actually much faster. And of course, uh, speed <coughs> is a very important aspect of what we do during a resuscitation. It's much faster, much more readily accepted, and uh, thought to be easier by the subjects in his study. Uh, another one of our fellows who recently uh, graduated, Ritu Shikara, uh, did a couple of interesting studies. Um, she looked at uh, determining uh, the accuracy of, of human senses and uh, determining heart rate uh, during resuscitation. And as Nicole just mentioned, uh, the algorithm that drives uh, our uh, interventions during resuscitation is uh, based upon what the heart rate is at that any moment in time. So the ability to accurately detect heart rate uh, really uh, determines whether we can do the things that need to be done for the patient. Uh, what Ritu found in this study, which was published last year in resuscitation, was that actually human beings are not very good 
at either listening to heart rate or palpating a heart rate in the uh, by the uh, umbilical artery and the umbilical cord. Uh, this was a great study in terms of showing the value of simulation in comparing what we can do what we do with uh, in various procedures with patients. This would be an extremely difficult, if not impossible, study to do in the real delivery room. Uh, certainly to obtain consent under these kinds of circumstances is impossible. Uh, but when you think of all the variables, uh, different stethoscopes, uh, different levels of ambient noise, different patients, different size umbilical cords, uh, heart tones that are changing uh, from second to second, uh, some that are loud, some that are quiet, um, the, the number of variables is quite huge. In this study, we're actually able to uh, uh, narrow the variables down to essentially uh, the human beings, uh, their ability to actually detect uh, the heart rate. Because we use the same mannequin, the heart tones came from the same location in the chest, uh, they were the same volume, uh, they had the same pitch, um, and even the ambient noise in the room was uh, the same for all of these scenarios. So it's a great example of how simulation can help us answer some very difficult clinical questions. Ritu also looked at an uh, uh, ergonomic issue uh, in terms of code parts. I mentioned during that second video that I showed you that uh, uh, you saw people who were in very awkward positions uh, trying to do a life-saving procedure. Um, we looked at uh, just the two types of code parts that are used, one that was standard in our institution and one that we designed specifically uh, for newborn resuscitation. Um, and what we found is that the standard code card actually was not very good in terms of people's ability to obtain the right equipment uh, and the right size of that equipment uh, in a speedy fashion during your resuscitation. The uh, code card that was done, designed specifically for uh, newborns actually was much, allowed us to perform at a much higher level. Uh, Janine Furch, Dr. Janine Furch, is one of our second year fellows who uh, unfortunately couldn't be here today because of an illness in her family. Uh, she's been doing some very interesting work along with uh, Dr. Yamada. Uh, we have been looking at a novel decision support tool, uh, a device that, again, based on newborn heart rate detection, uh, provides decision support uh, to people uh, practicing uh, newborn resuscitation in the real delivery room. Uh, what we do it all the time in our nursery here at Stanford, uh, many of the places where this is done across the United States, there are very small nurseries, very small delivery services, some as small as 40 or 50 deliveries a year. And so these difficult resuscitations will come around very often. But when they do, uh, people have to react quickly and they have to react correctly. Of course, if you're not doing this very often, if you're only doing this once every four or five years, it's very difficult to maintain that level of efficiency. So uh, this is a study that has been submitted and is under review by one of the major journals in, uh, in healthcare. And hopefully we're, we're, we're anticipating that it will be published uh, perhaps later this year or early next year. And finally, Janine also um, is leading a study. This is her own uh, uh, study uh, looking at um, uh, the way we display data at the bedside in the intensive care unit. Uh, if you look at the way we display data now, and of course we're getting more and more data streams on an, uh, practically a monthly basis uh, that become available to us so we can detect more and more things in our patients. But what we don't know is how many of these data streams can actually be accurately interpreted by human beings uh, who are at the bedside. It doesn't do any good to have 10 data streams being presented if you can only interpret two or three of those at a time. And so Janina is looking at how to optimize the display of data at the bedside, comparing that to what we currently have in our uh, neonatal intensive care unit, and uh, offering some suggestions as to uh, how people, you know, how the data can be displayed to allow people to more accurately and timely uh, make the correct diagnosis on the website. Uh, that's just a very quick summary of some of the other work that has been done over the last four or five years at our center. I just also want to end here mention a, a much bigger project, a uh, project that we're uh, in the early phases of at both Stanford University Hospital, which is our adult hospital on campus, and Packard Children's Hospital, which is a children's hospital. This is something I've been um, thinking about for a long time, actually. And the reality is that in healthcare, if we want to deliver uh, care in a, more, in a safer, more effective, and more efficient fashion, we need a number of different things. We need accurate and timely data, which can then be translated into actionable information. Uh, we have to make those uh, decisions in an informed and collaborative manner with our colleagues. We oftentimes have to implement these decisions rapidly. 
and they have to be disseminated throughout our entire system, which involves not just the local bedside or the local unit, but actually the entire hospital and the hospitals and clinics associated with that hospital. And uh, of most interest to me, with my background in simulation, I want the ability to recreate and analyze near misses and adverse events in very high fidelity. The question is, how do we go about this? Well, I've been working uh, with some systems engineers for a couple of years now on a concept that we call the hospital operations. And this is something that's actually been done in um, a relatively low scale at a few hospitals across the United States, primarily looking at uh, physiologic monitoring of patients within the hospital and the early detection of patients who are beginning to decompensate. What we're proposing, though, is something much more comprehensive. As you can see on this diagram, uh, whether it's a single hospital or a group of hospitals, a hospital in a series of referring hospitals out in the community, what we hope to do is create a true hospital operations center, much like uh, Mission Control at Johnson Space Center in Houston, and couple that with uh, some very sophisticated simulated environments, what I call hospital-specific environments. So these simulated environments are not uh, uh, just uh, uh, close approximations of what happens or what the actual environment looks like and functions like. They're actually uh, just like the real hospital environment. Uh, and what we hope to see is that as comprehensive system data, uh, system performance data flows from the hospital into the op center, that uh, what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to take those near misses and adverse events uh, that occur on a daily basis in any hospital pump those events, recreate them in the hospital specific environments, come up with solutions after we analyze the performance of the performance systems of those that were uh, in action during those events, make recommendations which then come back uh, as part of the overall hospital operations direction out of the ops center. Uh, we also see those hospital specific environments being used for, of course, on the front end training and assessment and alpha and beta testing of procedures and technologies before those are implemented in the real uh, world environment. So we're at the very early phases of this. Uh, uh, I just published a, a short article uh, in lay terms uh, in Children's Hospital today, the October edition, describing this in a bit more detail. But uh, we're very excited by the potential here. We think this is going to revolutionize the way hospitals operate as we begin to look at other industries, other high-risk industries that have used systems engineering for many, many years and begin to incorporate those kinds of principles into healthcare. So with that, uh, I think uh, we'll turn it over uh, uh, to uh, you and uh, our other colleagues here um, and be happy to take any questions. Hello, and thank you very much for you and your team's presentation. So I'm just wanting to uh, look at the website if any questions post on the line here. So I haven't seen anything yet. OK. Um, so Ola or John, do you have some questions to ask now? <clears throat> Just a couple of comments as usual. Uh, first of all, Lou, I, I think that um, the very fact that you're willing to videotape your observations and share the errors is important. And and traveling around to a lot of a lot of places over the summer. Um, I heard a lot of good things, people talking about problems that they saw. And I would say, well, geez, you know, do you, do you have the video that shows what the problem was? And basically the answer is we would never show that to anybody, which is really unfortunate because the, the context of improvement is in, in watching the nurse on her knees trying to operate a pair of e a set of equipment. And, and so somehow you've overcome the uh, fear of the fact that we all have problems and sharing the problems themselves could be really helpful. So thank you for that. Well, you're welcome, John. Uh, you know, the video that you show, the people who come to our training center for the most part are very open to what, I mean, their goal is to improve the care of patients. That's, that's why we do this. Uh, I think that's a special drive within uh, those of us who are pediatricians. And so uh, the folks that come to us very much want to be open to the fact that, you know, number one, we all make mistakes no matter how long we've been doing this. Number two, our environments really are not well designed to help us succeed. So the more we can talk about that, the more we can communicate that to our colleagues, especially colleagues in other industries where, you know, the kinds of environmental challenges that we face, ergonomic challenges that we face, simply not be tolerated. 
um, it's gonna it's gonna open up this whole area, and I actually think that this is uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit here in healthcare to go after, provided we create the right types of collaboration. Those of us who are sort of embedded in healthcare, and those of you who have expertise from your other high risk industries. So, so I think uh, I think you bring great points. You know, mention about system engineering. I think uh, we have a lot of common interests about that, you know, and also uh, this is a very common challenge in other industry who have complexity issues. Uh, when we add more technology to healthcare, this is getting even more challenging. Um, you mentioned, you know, beyond just the trainees and also how to design system robust in order to compensate, you know, the, the you know the, the you know limitation of a human being, which is you know uh, it's not the conventional thinking for healthcare because healthcare we're always trying to think in excellence, you know, individualized, you know, versus you know how we can. New, 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 new thinking is new paradigm shifting. How to design the system to 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 to, to better uh, facilitate the helping people perform well. So this is a total, totally different paradigm. Shift. I think yeah. that's actually very correct. Uh, uh, you know, as we've been exploring this hospital operations center concept, what we found is that um, you know most hospitals are like a bad home remodel in that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you start out with something, and then you start to add. You decide you want a little more space. You want an extra bathroom. You need a little more space in your garage. And pretty soon, what you end up with is something. That, yeah, you've got more space, but it doesn't work very well. <laughs> you have to walk through your cold garage to get to your extra bathroom, and that's really not very functional. That's mm -hmm. why most hospitals have been uh, built. And so, what we're finding is that not only do we need to think about physical structure in terms of, especially in terms of you know the ergonomics of, of how those workspaces. Uh, Allow us to function, but also uh, think about recreating from the ground up how we as healthcare professionals are required to function within our spaces and what we should be expecting of ourselves and our systems. So we have a unique opportunity here with actually two hospitals being built to rethink that and begin to tackle this problem. So I'm quite excited by it. Yeah. You also mentioned our collaboration across different dis uh, disciplines. I think all is one of a representative from engineering community. I think he is working with Eric and other folks, you know, helping design, you know, workflow for ED and other. So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, uh, Lou, and also your colleague Nicole, and so h how you guys interact with um, engineers or system engineers with manufacturing expertise? Do you have uh, some in-house people, or you just, you know, find some colleagues in university settings, which is across campus, which is sometimes, you know, it's not uh, always available for a lot of uh, healthcare providers. You know, can you guys comment about that? Uh, second question for for your uh, fellow, I think uh, when you get to start your know, new career in medicine, you know, how do you uh, devote the time for learning medicine versus learning this system thinking and engineering concept? You know, how how how? Nicole, you first. Um, well, I can kind of take on first question. We don't really have any organized system engineers on a regular basis. In um, and then even in the design of hospitals, they're not as systematically phase in the planning. And from an education standpoint, I like to have no formal exposure to the field um, within the medical. So much of our medical training is focused on doing the science and the physiology and how to teach the students. Not much about the business of running practice or how to best plan in the hospital. I think there's um, a gap in, in our knowledge, so it's important for us to include experts in those fields um, earlier rather than later because it's not something that we really have the capacity to plan for. Uh, you know, um, I have a question for you, Nicole. Uh, based on your research, do you recommend uh, the duty community? And any changes in the environment, um, and if so, did they take it seriously and willing to do these changes, or was it hard to implement the changes? Yeah, okay. So changing the way that people communicate um, is a behavior change, which can be challenging for people. So I think um, you know one of the things that I've learned um, through working with experts at the Federal Aviation Administration was I talked to air traffic controllers and their trainers um, on a visit that I had earlier in June with them, and one of the things I learned when they were changing the culture in their industry was that you have to change the entire culture. You can't just tell people to talk a certain way. They need to understand that this is a behavioral change and why it's important. As far as affecting how we uh, perform neonatal resuscitation, I'm still hoping to, to do a bigger study before I really um, 
push the organizations that develop our algorithms for this type of change, but I think that it's coming. I think it's important, and it hopefully will be inevitable. The thing is that we, for example, in our training, don't have any formal um, behavioral skills or communication training during our learning of this algorithm. So we learn the contents of the algorithm, what the clinical decisions are, technically how to do things like to put a breathing tube in or to do chest compressions, but there's no way that anybody is specifically taught, for example, to communicate. It's left to how each individual person speaks. And so that element of um, human interaction is very variable, and I would argue that it needs to be standardized. You can see that we're dealing with uh, some, as I mentioned, some relatively low-hanging fruit in terms of standardization of communication. That's something that um, you know we can agree upon. That's the way you can see we can agree on the lexicon that we can use. I think the much more challenging issues in all of this are going to be around the culture change piece, uh, as Nicole was alluding to. You know, if you look at the two teams that I showed you doing those simulations, uh, you know, one was an obstetric team. And that was just the very first time they tried, you know, they knew that there were issues in, in being able to move a patient urgently from one room to another. And they weren't concerned about trying to do it perfectly. They were concerned about trying to do it realistically. So that mm -hmm. way they could find out where the weaknesses in the system were, where the weaknesses in their own performance were, so they knew what to attack and to try to make better. And they were actually able to implement change within the organization to, to simplify and streamline that process because of their willingness to say, hey, you know, we know we don't do things perfectly. Let's find out why and let's change it. Similarly, during that uh, heart-lung bypass scenario, uh, you saw a very high-performing team, very experienced individuals who, once again, were willing to, to sort of go outside their comfort zone and say, okay, you know, we know things don't happen perfectly during these kinds of emergencies. Let's see why they are. Some of those may be due to the way we communicate uh, because we don't have a standard lexicon. Uh, when we're in these really desperate situations, but some of them are due to our environment and how our environment sets us up to fail. So we've been very fortunate at CAPE and that the people that we have worked with have been very open to, from a cultural standpoint uh, within healthcare to, to readily admitting that things don't always go well and trying to find better ways to, to do things uh, for the sake of our patients. And you know, we couldn't do the work that we do and our colleagues couldn't do the work that we do without those kinds of folks coming to us. Uh, and being willing to just, you know, get out of their comfort zone and say, let's, let's, let's find out what we don't know, let's find out better ways to do things. Unfortunately, that's not true within, within all of healthcare. Uh, as you have probably noticed, uh, there is a tendency to sort of not want to talk about these difficult issues and not want to kind of air your dirty laundry and say, you know, admit that we don't always do things perfectly. Uh, one of the things we, we try to do here at, at Stanford is people coming up in training, we try to let them know no matter how many years we've been on the faculty, we all make mistakes. Now, what I've seen repeatedly now, and I've been in simulation for almost 20 years, since 1995, is that the level of human performance invariably degrades to some extent when people under realistic time pressure. So none of us perform at the same level of proficiency when we're under realistic time pressure. We wouldn't say a skill station just between practice. And that's an important realization for everybody to have. Uh, and then what that does then is once you, once you understand that and appreciate that, it makes you, I think, even more motivated to find better ways of doing things, especially create an environment that ergonomically allows you to perform at a higher level so you're not working against that too, in addition to your own uh, potential weaknesses. Uh, question or, or comment? Dude, uh, I was really happy to hear you say you got that paper accepted for IMSH. And, yeah. and in the context of, of some of the comments you were just making, I, I would ask that you find a way to present it so there can be no mistake in the mind of the listeners that what you're showing them is not a training event, that it's a research event. Because the you know, I, part of the problem that I personally have with some of what the society maybe isn't doing right now, and part of the reason this group was formed, is to, to communicate that there's a lot more that can be done with simulation than teaching. And yet, as I, as I watched, I can imagine most of your audience at IMSH thinking that they're supposed to watch these people learning how to do rather than that they're watching people do so that you can study what they're doing. So if you can keep reminding them that this is research, um, that might be helpful. 
you've done yeah. that in the past. <laughs> I, I, I will agree how hard it is done. Uh, you know, the, the simulation environment in terms of uh, being able to standardize uh, uh, various characteristics of that environment, limit the number of variables, it, it far exceeds what we can do in the real environment. Of course, you want some sort of correlation with what happens in real life in terms of real patients. If you begin to look at some of these issues, it's, it, it's very important to be able to simulate these things first. What I actually advise our, our junior faculty to do, those who are interested in simulation, is to not think about going into simulation in terms of research, looking at, uh, you know, does it work, uh, and looking at the training and education side of things, but actually focusing more on the research piece and, and not so much research around training. Done a wonderful job of that during her fellowship by taking a very interesting, uh, problematic issue that we have in healthcare and using simulation to study it in a very effective fashion. And for people who want a career in, in healthcare simulation, I definitely would push them in that direction rather than simply looking at its use for training and education, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, there's a great, great point. I think uh, simulation research, there's a two, you know, branches. One, you know, simulation, simulation as a research subject versus a simulation as a research tool because, you know, we can use that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, because understanding the system or interaction between system and human beings, I think this is, we are learn along the way. I think other industries have been doing this for many decades, you know, I think uh, that's, for example, like uh, all our, you know, system engineering approach in doing this for for many decades. So, Ola, would you mind just comments about from other industry when you know bring your uh, system thinking to healthcare? Uh, what you see the challenges, opportunities, you know, from engineering perspective? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, my type of engineering uh, simulation is different. It's not the medical or the mannequin-based simulation. Uh, it's the computer-based simulation. Um, specifically, I use the um, discrete event simulation or agent-based simulation to mimic the real system and a computer model and try to um, study what if scenarios to improve the systems. Um, mostly it will be operational decisions um, more than uh, could be human if we can uh, do agent-based to change the interactions between the hu uh, humans um, in, in computer simulation. Um, some challenges are like um, doctors would say that we know what we do and uh, we don't want to change, like resistance to change will be a huge uh, problem in our team. Uh, we're consisted of lean team. They do lots of uh, lean and Six Sigma, and I, I, I'll be doing the model and simulation part. Um, so there's lots of resistance from uh, to change uh, based on these techniques. Uh, that's what we are seeing, and also um, um, the language is different. Like we are, an, uh, I'm not a clinician, so sometimes there is a semantic problem how to um, 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 build the conceptual model of the system in uh, a natural language that engineers and physicians can understand. Um, but we're getting there and uh, there is um, um, a big uh, room for, for these simulations to make changes in healthcare, I think. Thank you. I think this is this the hope, hope for this community. This uh, uh, affinity group try to bring, you know, different community clinicians, you know, engineers, you know, to a, a, a same common interest, in particular, our focus on the health design system to, 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 to facilitate better care, better delivery. I think this is also important to, you know, uh, you know work, work together. Uh, one last question for Lou, Lou for you guys. So, uh, how you get this funding for your work? It's been very challenging, you know, in general for simulation research, you know, for, for, for you know, how, how do you get the funding for your research? Um, very good question, and we use uh, a combination of different resources. Uh, as you mentioned, it's extremely difficult to find funding to allow people to, to answer these kinds of questions. In general, I don't think healthcare really understands how to use simulation at this point. It's just thought of as, you know, as John mentioned earlier, you know, you're training junior people to do sort of elementary technical skills. That's how it gets used. Uh, they think about it in terms of medical students, nursing students, uh, residents, and students. And uh, it's, it's very uh, uncommon to see it being used implemented with people who are very similar, uh, which is unlike a lot of the other industries out there that use simulation on a regular basis. So we've done over the years, and we, our center has been in existence, and it's self-funded itself essentially you know, since 2003. Uh, we have an endowment that we use to support our activities that can't be supported in other ways. Uh, we've used uh, funding to do specific research projects. Uh, for example, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality here in the United States has uh, 
uh, have passed on a couple of our projects uh, because I think that's a group of folks who understands these issues quite well. Um, we have um, uh, direct uh, tuition uh, being paid. Come to us for training programs, primarily actually simulation instructor programs where they learn more about how to use simulation either for training or for research or both. Um, and then we have contracts with area hospitals for training. So uh, we try a, a series of different things. Uh, we use a series of different things to keep the funds uh, flowing so that we can keep our doors open. Uh, but uh, it is very challenging. On the other hand, uh, it gives us, because we're not tied to any particular institution, gives us tremendous freedom to pursue things that we think are of interest. And the last thing we want to do is, is be completely funded, but be told how we need to spend our time. Because in many instances when that happens, uh, unfortunately you get locked into uh, carrying out uh, relatively basic training programs uh, for people on a regular basis. And you know, I know the people who work at CAPE, uh, our training center, would not be content with that. And so I think we need to look at a number of different types of sources in order to do the sorts of things that we do. And I would add to that that just from the grant funding perspective, um, I've gotten a couple of in my work. And what I found to be successful, at least in my experience, has been to really emphasize the clinical value of doing the work for the research work that we're doing. Um, I think that some people would approach simulation research and work using simulation just sort of for simulation's sake and what is the cool technology and what are the cool things that we could make the mannequin do. But we're that would really would make an impact on the field um, is something that makes the application for funding more uh, powerful. So, so basically you mentioned, you know, how we can really can make a case, you know, this is really helping operation, hospital operation, you know, more efficiency, you know, provide the value for hospital and delivery value to patients, you know, our, our, our customer then really can showcase, you know, that's, you know, a good ROI, you know, in the end, you know, which is, this yeah. has been shown in the other industry for many, many different ways, you know, I think uh, we hopefully can see more of this kind of a uh, Well, work. the whole, the whole topic of research and simulation is opening up with some new interests in new places and uh, if you haven't seen that article in the August SSH journal which I was really happy to see they published that was done by uh, Dubrowski and a group of Canadians on the state of research and healthcare simulation that it's, it's very highly worth a read easy read but um, you know a lot of the stuff that you're doing is is out so far beyond the problematic things that Adam points out in the article um, that that it's got some direction. Yeah, you know, there's there's a wide open field for us yeah. if if we'll go there. Right. Yeah. So and I'm gonna be at Human Factors Ergonomics Society meeting, the big main one next week in Chicago. Is is this particular presentation, you know, maybe we can cut the discussion points off the end, um, a version of it without the discussion. Um, would it be available to public access through oh. our... Of, of, of course, this is, you know, I think uh, this okay. is, you know... I just problem. want to get a direct link to it, and I'll I print it on little cards and hand it out. In sure, Chicago. I send you a link. You know, for this on YouTube channel, you know, globally available yeah. for, for for anybody to review. You know, okay. yep, uh, well, I think uh, time mind, to uh, close four o'clock, and I think I haven't seen any other question on the YouTube channel and also the uh, you know Google channel chat. But uh, I think we you know, close this session. I would thank you so much for Lou and your team to presenting your innovative work and share with us your uh, great advance for to this field. You know, uh, we're looking forward to learning more your work and through sort of the publications. And uh, thank you also, John and Ola, to join this discussion. You know, with us. You know, and uh, it's great. Uh, we should have a great day. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.